let's go ahead and deploy and configure the Unity VSA. The following demo will show you how to deploy a Unity VSA to a single VMware host from start to finish, including the initial configuration that occurs after the startup of the Unity VSA appliance. We're going to do our installation of our Unity VSA to a standalone VMware ESXi host. When we connect via the IP address or DNS name, we're presented with a web interface. We have two ways to connect. We can either use the vSphere client for Windows, or we can use the VMware host client web interface. In this case, we're going to use the web interface because we don't need to do an installation to our local machine in order to accomplish what we need. So go ahead and click on the Open the VMware Host Client link. What this will do is present you with a login screen. Go ahead and log in to your host. Once you're logged in, you'll be presented with the host information. It'll show you things like manufacturer, model, CPU, memory, things like that. You will also have access to the virtual machines, storage, and networking that are configured on this particular host. We're going to start by creating or registering a VM. We're presented with a new virtual machine wizard. We have three different options to start. The first is to create a new virtual machine. The next is deploy a virtual machine from OVF or OVA file. And finally, register an existing virtual machine. In our case, we're going to deploy a virtual machine from an OVF or OVA file. An OVF or OVA file are files that basically allow you to take a pre-packaged, pre-canned virtual machine and do an import into your environment with all the proper configurations. A lot of times they also build in wizard capabilities or additional parameters that you can utilize during your implementation. So let's click Next to begin. We have to select our OVF and VMDK files along with naming of the virtual machine. It is best practice and also my recommendation that if you create a virtual machine, you want to keep the name matching the host name that's inside of your guest machine. Well, why is that important? So when you create a virtual machine, if you've used VMware before, you know that you have the display name that shows up in the web interface, and you have the name that's actually in the operating system. If those don't match, it can oftentimes cause confusion and make it a little more difficult to support your environment. So it is my recommendation and also a best practice that we do that matchup of names so we don't have any confusion moving forward. So we're going to go ahead and name our machine test-san01. Let's go ahead and click to select files or drag and drop. We have the ability to drag and drop, but if you click, it'll also bring up a file browser to use for you to select your individual files that you need. We're going to go ahead and select our grouping of files and click open. You notice that it automatically lists all the files that we added here, and it removed anything that was extraneous. I went ahead and tried to add an additional file from the previous screen, and it didn't allow us. If you did for some reason grab an extra VMDK or OVF file that didn't belong, you could click on the X to delete it from this listing. Since we have everything that we need, let's go ahead and click Next. When it comes to storage, we have several different things we have to keep in mind. First and foremost, the best practice is to keep the actual virtual machine that runs Unity VSA separate from the LUNs or disks that we're going to attach for client consumption. So I've created two data stores in preparation for this machine's import. One is for data, one is for OS. So let's select the one named VSA underscore OS underscore DS01 and select Next. On the deployment options screen, this particular OVF template has the ability for us to change the network mappings and modify the disk provisioning. So first, we're going to start with the management network. We're going to leave it at 55 underscore server. That particular network is specific to the server network. So when we manage machines, we put them all in the same VLAN so that we can uh, traverse back and forth from a management perspective. Your network is going to be different, so you select the ones that are most appropriate. Then we have our data network ports, 0, 1, 2, and 3. The first two, 0 and 1, we're going to reserve for that 55 server network because later when we deploy file out to our client base, we're going to want to utilize those network ports in order to access those networks. Data ports 2 and 3, we're going to change those over to the iSCSI network so we can serve up data to clients over iSCSI. For disk provisioning, we have two different options. We have thin and thick. Thin gives you the ability to deploy a machine and have it only consume as much as you're consuming. So what that means is if you have a 100 gig virtual machine and you're only consuming 10 gigs of it, you're only going to show a 10 gig usage. 
but if you choose thick, it's going to go ahead and deploy it as 100 gigs, so you're going to consume 100 gigs worth of capacity on disk. There are some pros and cons for thin versus thick, and it all comes down to your environment and your preferences. So go ahead and make the selection that's right for your environment, and click Next to continue. Here under Additional Settings, we have several different options. We have System Name first and foremost. What we want to do is make this system name the same as the name of the virtual machine, again following our best practice and recommendations. And then we have the ability to deploy an IPv4 or an IPv6 management address. In our case, we don't have an IPv6 management network, so we're going to go ahead and leave that empty, but we are going to populate the information for the IPv4 network. Once we've got our network information and our system name in, we can click Next to continue. We're now on the Ready to Complete screen. This is a review screen. We'll be able to see all the changes that we made and we can review to make sure that we don't have any changes that we want to make at this point because a lot of times it's easier to make your configuration changes here. Make sure that you're valid and ready to go before you do your deployment. If we scroll down, we notice this big warning that says do not refresh your browser while this VM is being deployed. The reason that's here is if you do your refresh during the VM deployment, what it'll do is stop that VM deployment and it'll leave sometimes behind some remnant files, but most of the time it does a pretty good job of cleaning up after itself. It's just a risk that we want to avoid, so we go ahead and click finish and we're going to allow it to deploy. Notice as soon as we hit finish, the recent tasks update with information pertinent to our deployment. Two of the three disks have already completed successfully. They've completed their upload and they're ready to go. The vApp, the actual virtual machine that's going to be deployed, is also uploading at this point. These deployment times are going to vary based on your environment. It is highly recommended that if you're doing a remote deployment that you stage these files on a machine that's at the remote site. That way all of the file transportation is done at the local site instead of across the WAN. VMware has timeouts associated with actions. So a lot of times what will happen if you try to deploy something like this across the WAN is it'll be too large and your connectivity speed will be a little too slow. So it'll hit a timeout period and it'll actually show a timeout message. That doesn't mean that it didn't complete the task. It doesn't mean that it failed. It just means that you're not going to get any information about how long it's going to take to finish the deployment. So it's always best to go ahead and leave this running from a local site instead of doing it across the WAN. Once the final VMDK finishes its deployment, the vApp will attempt to complete its configuration. It'll take just a few moments longer, but then when it's done, the machine will automatically reconfig and then attempt to power on. For us to check the status of the power on, we can click on the virtual machines section and then click on our particular virtual machine that we're working with. You may be prompted for your credentials again in order to open up the window to view the boot state of your machine. So once we click on the window, it'll give us a dialog box or a screen that lets us see the active console of that virtual workload. Depending on the speed of your environment and your configuration, this could take anywhere between five and 10 minutes for this machine to boot up for the first time. Have patience. If you try to get jumpy and start messing around with this virtual machine, powering it off or doing power cycles or whatever the case may be, you can cause damage to the virtual machine and make it so you have to do a redeploy. This is just like starting up a Windows machine for the first time. It's got to check out the hardware that it's sitting on. It's got to do log file configurations. It's got to take some additional steps that are part of the deployment. So give it some extra time when it first boots up and you'll be successful with your deployment. If you start messing with it early, the chances are pretty high that you're going to cause delays or other problems for this virtual machine. So again, patience is key. If you're like me, one of the best things you can do in a situation like this is to walk away from the virtual machine that's booting. If you come back periodically, you'll be less apt to look at any type of errors that might have come up uh, during this initial boot. You will oftentimes see warnings and errors during the first boot of a virtual machine from an OVF deployment or an OVA deployment just because of the fact that it has to do a lot of configuration items that are specific to your environment. So you want to make sure that you let it run its course. Don't get too worked up about errors and warnings until the full boot is complete. Now that our login screen is available, an important thing to note is that the machine is not technically booted yet. So close out of your console window and come back to the listing for your machine. Notice the host name says booting. And you also notice that in the networking section it says booting as well. What you want to do is have patience here, periodically hit refresh, 
And once that no longer says booting and it actually shows the host name that we entered earlier, we'll be able to go in and log into our Unity VSA at that point. Until that booting message goes away, you will not be able to log in. So have patience here as well. Again, a VSA will take a long time during its first boot up. Next time you boot or restart, it will be significantly quicker and easier to deal with. We're going to hit refresh one final time. You'll notice that the host name has updated along with the networking information. Our virtual machine at this point should be fully deployed and ready to consume. Let's open up another browser window and put in the IP address of this Unity VSA that we've deployed. Once you put in the IP address of the Unity VSA, you'll be presented with a certificate warning page. Make sure to continue to this web page. You'll be presented with a login screen to continue. This lets us know that we've finished the basic deploy and configuration of our Unity VSA.